Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and a proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Erica and I are out of the studio and we're exploring this beautiful fall day in Indiana. And this week we're going to be on the hunt for the spooky, the scary, the supernatural, and we're gonna take you all across the state to do it. Travel to the Culbertson Mansion, where whispers of a haunting have helped bring the past to present. Stroll through the haunted village of Metamora, a historic canal town where ghouls lurk behind the corners for a good cause. Return to Fear Fair, a nationally recognized haunted house in Columbus, Indiana, leading the way for haunters against hate. And flee the Broad Ripple Zombie Walk as thousands fill the streets donating canned goods in exchange for brains. All this and more on this week's spooky weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagon. And I'm Daryl Muir. All right, Daryl, we're coming up upon Halloween, and I have to know do you have a favorite costume from years past? I love my devil's outfit. I think that's spot on, but who knows what this year it will bring? Something spooky, I'm sure. Well, you know, Erica, <laughs> one of the things I really love this time of year is a great haunted house. And we're going to go to New Albany, where in 1867 this beautiful mansion was built, and there are rumors that some of the guests may have never left. In the heart of historic New Albany, Indiana, sits the Culbertson Mansion. Built in 1867 by wealthy businessman William Culbertson, the 20,000 square foot home is one of the state's finest examples of Second Empire architecture. So it was a family home. William had 10 kids all together with his first two wives, uh, but truly only three of them had their childhoods here. Um, the eldest would have been Ann Culbertson. She was probably about 12 or 13 when they moved into the house. Her little brother Sam was also here, he was probably about nine or 10. And then uh, little Blanche was the youngest of the Culbertson children. She was the only child born here. So it was always a, a bustling home, I guess you'd say. The home remained in the family until shortly after Culbertson's death in 1892. Over the following decades, the home's once stately appearance began to deteriorate, a victim of time and multiple owners. By the 1960s, the abandoned mansion faced an unknown fate. We were nearly torn down. There was an oil company interested in tearing down the mansion and building a gas station here on the corner for downtown. Fortunately for us, our neighbors did not let that happen. And at that point is when we kind of became a museum for the first time in the early 70s, a local businessman named Dick Stem and an organization called Historic New Albany uh, purchased the house and kind of put in New Albany's first little center for local history. And that's probably when all the, uh, the spooky stories started, was when the restoration started. Every year, the house begins a new restoration project. And with everything new, something old seems to come back. The third floor is popular for ghostly happenings, so it's a little darker, a little more dingy, looks creepy, <laughs> um, so it might entice uh, the, the ghosts um, to stay up there. The servant's wing in particular um, seems to get a lot of activity or a lot of reports of activity. We had a gentleman in here one day who had a seeing eye dog, um, and there's an area on the third floor in the servant's wing called the Culbertson's Punishment Closet. It was the timeout room for the children. So we allow people to go in and out of the punishment closet. It's a favorite spot on the tour. His dog refused to enter. He kind of bulked at the threshold and got real defensive and wouldn't go in. In addition to apparitions and feelings of unease, visitors and neighbors have reported phantom light phenomena and strange smells. 
These ghostly events introduced an unlikely opportunity for the mansion's caretakers, a haunted house, carried out in the old carriage house barn to both further the home's legacy and provide for its future restoration. So the haunted house actually started as a restoration fundraiser, and that's how it still exists today. All these gorgeous ceilings, um, you know, these beautiful artifacts, all, this amazing mansion has all almost been completely funded by chasing people across the yard with chainsaws. It's completely conceived by and is built and planned every year by the friends of Colbertson Mansion. So they're our not-for-profit group that's attached to the house, and they have a wonderful group of, we call them our spooks, very talented. I could not begin to even imagine the things that they can do. It's all completely, you know, they volunteer their time, none of them are paid, you know, they donate their own materials, um, and it's all 100% just to see the mansion restored. On a day-to-day -day basis, you do get those folks that hear those uh, stories from the carriage house, from the haunted house, come into our historical tours expecting to hear um, about that, and we, we often have to uh, disappoint them. But, um, you know, by the time they get in the house, they're so overwhelmed with its, its beauty that they're fine with it. The Haunted House will stay as long as our volunteers are willing to keep doing it. Um, and they have fun doing it, we love doing it, um, and it benefits the mansion greatly. So we'll keep doing it as long as they want to. Want to visit this historic haunted mansion? It's not too late to meet these turn of the century ghostly guests. For hours and directions, visit indianamuseum.org. Daryl, it's amazing to learn that this renovation was funded entirely by the community. Or more appropriately, community spirits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But would you stay in that house? Absolutely. How about you? Absolutely not. It's <laughs> enough that we are in the cemetery right now. Spooky <laughs> enough. Well, speaking of community spirit, next up, we're going to travel to Metamora, where every Halloween, the entire community comes together for a haunting that you have to see to believe. The historic canal town of Metamora offers visitors a chance to escape the city and experience the life of bygone days. But when the unincorporated village needed money for additional tourist amenities, residents came up with a unique fundraising plan. They'd bring Metamora's past to the present, but with a spooky twist. They came to me and asked me to be a tour guide because I'm not a bashful person. When I got here ready to go, we took off running with it and there was people always there. I helped them out for two years and all of a sudden they, they quit. They just weren't gonna do it anymore. It was such a big success, we done good. I told the merchants, I says, why don't we just pick it up? You know, everybody was loving it, it's fun, let's keep it a family thing and do it. And so every Halloween, Metamora is transformed into a haunted village. Every dollar made is put back towards the town inspiring the whole community to participate. Merchants decorate their shops and a volunteer crew spends hundreds of hours planning and preparing the haunts in between. It's a brainstorm on the back porch of our shop and it's a matter of six, eight, ten people just sitting around saying, what do we do about this? How about we try this? Maybe we improve on something else or try and make it bigger. And in the process, something new pops up from somebody else. Every year we try and add something new, something creative, something imaginative, but yet not over the top like you get at a lot of these haunted houses. We gear everything down towards the younger generation, the kids. If the atmosphere is good, everybody has a good time. We start at the beginning of town and we put everybody on a hay wagon and we take them around town to the back streets and then we walk them zigzag all through scary spots. Each little section has their own little theme like and we made scenes that didn't work at all. It was like, okay, scrap it out, start again tomorrow, take it off the route, <laughs> you know. That's why I tell them, if you take the first tour out and the last tour out, they're totally different because the scarers are in different places. Things change, they found something else worked, so therefore they just go with it. And it's never the same twice. The scenes are built from donated set pieces and decorations. And each year, they repurpose used costumes and makeup meaning anyone that wants to participate can at no cost. They're free for all. When you want something, you come down and get it. You want fake blood, you holler. You want makeup, there's buckets of makeup that's set out there. Each night, around 60 volunteers show up to help, ranging in age from three to 73. And the scarers of Metamora? Let's just say most of them have a curfew. Our town, they say there's like 270 total population. And I would say every kid down here in uptown's down here scaring. 
I don't know how many that is because every night we have a different amount of scares. I always tell everybody they're free will scares. They show up wherever they want to be. As long as they don't play on them tracks, they're good to go. And when they're done, they get a free ice cream. And that, that's what they scare for, that free ice cream. That, that's good for kids. <laughs> and they see all the kids and the adults together playing, and it's good. I mean, parents and kids need to play together. It would seem that in Metamora's haunted village, the family that scares together stays together. We love scaring people. It's kind of brought my whole family closer together. My mother-in-law is a participant in it, my son, my husband. So it's been a lot of fun. Just watching my kids and how much they really enjoy this. I think he dressed up probably around noon today, ready to go at 7.30. I'm like, we still got a while, but he was ready to go. <laughs> I think it's really gonna just create memories for them. When they grow up, they're always gonna look back and say, remember when mom and dad had the restaurant in Metamora and we got to dress up and we got to do this and that. And I think it's really cool that they'll get to remember this forever. Well, dad's, he's Jason and he's he bangs on trash cans as soon as they get out and that lets me know to jump out of the bush. We have mom who's a clown and she tours them around, but whenever she's not, she chops on the board like she's chopping something up. And then my grandma throws guts on the floor. Well, I like seeing their reactions. And whenever they jump, that's really funny. And what are Aiden's top tips for scary tricks? If you one person passes, then you know the big group's gonna come, but if they don't come, then just get that one person and follow them behind, but don't try to make any noise once they realize you, then they run. I'm Chucky. And I get to scare people with Chucky and run at them. But as Connie sees it, the haunted village doesn't just teach the Metamora kids how to give a good scare. It teaches them responsibility. They learn it growing up here. You know, you have to organize stuff. It don't just happen. We have to work together. You have to explain it to someone. If your costume isn't working, ask why. You know, find out why. But let's try to work together and get it all going. They know the grown-ups can't scare like the kids can. The kids are awesome scarers. <laughs> and after 15 years of working hard each Halloween, Connie's motivation remains the same. Seeing the kids smile and seeing them sit on the back porch afterwards and enjoying it and knowing that they feel like they have accomplished something. They've helped town out, they participated, and they are important. The Haunted Village continues until Halloween. Don't miss out on this frighteningly fun opportunity to meet the folks of Metamora. Learn more at the Haunted Village of Metamora Facebook page. Daryl, these kids are having the time of their lives. What a fun thing for them to look forward to every year. Well, do you have a favorite Halloween childhood memory? Hmm. Well, it's not a big one, but I did love trading candy with my friends. After the fact, I wanted all of the chocolate, and if it wasn't chocolate, <laughs> they could have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Erica, you remember our good friends from Fear Fair? Yeah, they came to the studio a couple of years ago, and they zombified us. Yeah, well, they're still running the greatest hot haunted house in the state of Indiana, but this time they're going above and beyond, and they're doing good in the world. Fear Fair is a haunted attraction. We are the largest in Indiana. We are an indoor-outdoor haunted house. We have animated scares, and we also have a large cast of actors. This has been the only thing I've ever gotten into that never seems to run out. There's always something new to do, constantly. 2002, we moved into this building, and it seemed huge, and we thought, how are we ever gonna fill this? And now we're busting at the seams as usual. We need a little bit more room already. In the earlier years, we were all about movie scenes, and then we've kind of started an initiative about four years ago to get away from any trademarked or copyright material and do all original stuff. For a couple of years now, we've been on the USA Today top 10 for the nation. We've been featured in Forbes magazine, and there are a lot of local haunt review groups. We always score relatively well on that. There are groups all over the country, and they will visit 40 to 50 haunted houses a year in the Ohio Valley region and they write detailed reviews on their sites. There was a review group in our area, and it was shortly after the Pulse nightclub tragedy in Florida. These guys who operated this review group were making all these posts on Facebook that were just really, really harsh. Slurs and all that. Travis, who owns 7th Street Haunt in Louisville, 
he and his husband, Matt, contacted a few of us other owners, we all stay in touch, and said, you know, we're just not going to let these guys come to our haunted house anymore. All of us immediately said, you know what, we're not either. And so we decided, what can we do to show some solidarity and some support? And I actually wrote an open letter that all of the original founding haunts of Hunters Against Hate all signed on to that we sent to this review group. Just as a way of making our opinion known and, and doing something about it. And since then, it now has booths at trade shows. We sell t-shirts for Hunters Against Hate and all of the proceeds go to various LGBTQ charities. Several haunts, we're doing one, are doing Haunters Against Hate nights this year that are gonna offer discounts and then also a portion of the proceeds are going to go to those type of charities. And so it's very important to become a support group and to bring awareness and to promote the idea of equality. Now more than ever, it's important that someone advance those kinds of issues and fight for those sorts of rights. It's just something I really personally believe in and it's something that the haunt industry as a whole really believes in. And so it's just something that's dear to all of our hearts that we feel needs representation right now. Before Haunters Against Hate, I think a lot of people who may have been gay would have felt that it might not be a friendly environment for them, or they might have felt threatened by it, or that there would be a lot of people there who wouldn't be understanding. And so we want to make it clear that that's not the case at all. In fact, it's a very welcoming group. Just about anybody here that you ask, what do you think about Fear Fair? Usually the first word they used to describe it is family because that's the atmosphere we try to build around here to make sure that everybody feels like they're among family. There's a lot of bonding that goes on because you're here so much. It becomes a hub or a central point. We've had kids who act on our cast and then go away to college and then come back and continue to act when they get back. You'll never find a more diverse group of people who come together and have a common goal and become such close friends than you will among a haunted house cast. And we want to make sure everybody knows that everyone's welcome in that family and that there's no room for hate in those families. We want to make sure everybody feels comfortable, everybody knows and understands that no matter where they're coming from or who they are, they're always welcome here. Obviously no one ever wants to be discriminated anywhere. And especially here, you know, there's that opportunity where people feel open already and they want to be able to open up and we don't want anyone to feel like that they can't be here and be happy and enjoy themselves. Whenever you come here, you're ready, you have energy, and the people around you are only hyping that up even more. So at the end of the day, I want everybody to enjoy what they're doing. If we don't have a good, cohesive group, then there's no way you can enjoy what you're doing. So the more comfortable the actor feels, the more comfortable the makeup artist feels, the better job they're going to do. So. Overall, it just helps improve the quality of uh, everything we do from makeup, design, acting, everything. The overall experience. People just think haunted house generically, but there's a big difference. There are more family-oriented haunted houses that aren't as scary. And then you'll have other places that are more focused around the jump scare, that are just all about the scare, that are much darker and less detailed, but, but more intense. I think we really fall in the middle. We're very detailed and we put a lot of thought into our acting and we have a lot of speaking characters and so we are theatrical in that range, but we try to always have a lot of jump scares too. The emotional and physical response of laughter and being scared or screaming are so close together. It's fun to get scared. It's more fun to scare people, but it's fun to get scared. You can't get this anywhere else. It's a personal experience. You're not detached in the form of a movie or a video game. It's just breaking that final barrier. It's one of those last personalized experiences of that nature you can get. There's just not much else out there that's like it. And so we're here to make sure that goes on for years and years. Think you can make it through Indiana's scariest haunted house? It's not too late to test your bravery. Learn more at fearfair.com. Erica, it's great to see our friends at Fear Fair doing such great work, but also using their national notoriety to fight for social justice. Yeah, certainly a great cause. Well, we are not done with zombies yet on this show. Right now, we're going to head up to Indianapolis for the Broad Ripple Zombie Walk, which raises money for Gleaner's Food Bank. So I guess you could say this is Hoosiers feeding Hoosiers, not Hoosiers feeding on Hoosiers. Let's take a look. Fall is the time for strolls in the brisk air, community gatherings, and harvests. But for Broad Ripple, 
It's all about brains? Broad Ripple's Zombie Walk is Indiana's largest flash mob of zombies. So it's in its ninth year this year. Robert Brady got together with his friends. They had seen this idea in other cities take off. So they printed off about 100 flyers, handed them around Broad Ripple, and they got about 50 people to show up. So it started off pretty small and it kind of grew from there every year. I think there's been this zombie culture kind of come about the past 10 years, especially with like The Walking Dead coming on, World War Z, different kind of zombie scenes popping up. Uh, and I mean, the idea of kind of taking over the street as a zombie and you know, if there's enough of you to take it over, then who can kind of tell you no type of thing, I think was uh, initially the fun part of it. And it, it grew from there. And with a thousand zombies, we now have to kind of warn people about us coming. You know, we can't just pop it up out of nowhere. Marching around Broad Ripple, you know, groaning. I mean, we have people going up to windows and, you know, you have people in restaurants not know what's going on. And so you give them that little bit of element of surprise. It's around Halloween, so that's always the a good reason to you know kind of get done up and kind of pretend to be something you're not so anyone can come out and be a zombie we have people come off the street kind of mess up their hair rip their shirt up we pour some blood on them and send them out on the walk but you know you do have some people that spend you know weeks preparing and looking into their costume and every year we have uh, people come back and try to top themselves of what they did the year before and how are they going to be creative this year and become a zombie and, and i think it's just something fun that the whole family can participate in it's free it's family friendly, so it's something everyone can do together. And it has been nothing but positive from the community. We take over intersections now instead of complete roads. You know, we walk down a certain area and we have a, a route that's marked. And, you know, people are very respectful of private property and things like that. But, you know, for that one moment, you, you do kind of get to walk out in the place that you're not supposed to be at, you know, and you get to growl at strangers and, you know, tear up the town, figuratively. <laughs> The positive community support inspired Zombie Walk to give back to the community in a way only a zombie could. To receive a shirt, participants donate all the food they no longer need in their hunt for brains. The idea of it being like right before Thanksgiving, uh, there was a big drive to, you know, what can we tie in with that kind of, you know, time of year. And of course, food is always a, a go-to thing. Gleaners is Indianapolis's largest food bank. They serve a huge population of people, so the partnership kind of naturally evolved. And then the idea that zombies eat brains and not food. They don't have any kind of need for their earthly possessions of food anymore, so they might as well give it away for a good cause. Each year, they strive to gather 5,000 pounds, one semi-truck full of food for gleaners. In total, they've donated over 20,000 pounds of food throughout the years. Being involved with uh, Broad Ripple Zombie Walk is such a neat experience. It's unlike anything else. You can't go anywhere in Indy for free, see fire spinners, bring your kids out, have them involved in carnival games, win prizes, you get your t-shirt, you can go get done up by professional makeup artists for free. And this is all just, you know, so that you bring cans and that you benefit cleaners. So it really is just for Broad Ripple, for Indianapolis and for the community. And uh, it's something that we love putting on. So, you know, who wouldn't want to get together and become a zombie for a night? For more information on the Broad Ripple Zombie Walk, visit their Facebook page. And while it may be too late to participate in this year's Zombie Walk, it's not too late to give back to the community. Visit gleaners.org to get involved in feeding fellow Hoosiers. Well, who knew that there were so many people across the state using Halloween to help their community? Well, that's the Hoosier spirit. <laughs> Very good, Daryl. <laughs> that's all the time we have for tonight, but we want to wish you a happy and spooky Halloween. And before we go, take a look back at one of our favorite weekly special Halloween memories. Good night. <laughs>
barely bowling. A strong nor'westers blowing, Bill. Oh, heart can't you hear? Now. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. The Al Cobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Al Cobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 